All right, so guys, tonight we have John of Baltimore Retro Gaming with us as our guest. He has a very big collection, a lot of focused on a lot of imports, a lot of rare Japanese imports. We're going to be asking about. Uh, I want to get his opinion on a lot of light gun games, which is something I've always been interested in. You know, specifically with the PS3, you have the move controllers, a lot of the gun attachments for that. I'm curious to find out about. So, John. Uh, how long ago did you start your YouTube channel? YouTube, uh, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, I was just in a position in life where I, I owned my own business, um, which I don't anymore. But uh, I owned my, I owned like a little T-shirt shop in a strip shopping center, so you know people would come by and you know, something on their phone, or they'd email something to me. I'd print it out on a shirt for them and. I really didn't make any money, but I had plenty of time on my hands, so I just talked about video games on YouTube, and yeah, that's pretty much how that happened. Were there any channels that kind of inspired you to do it going in? I don't... I, I, not really, but there, there's some people that and I want to say, like, I don't know if inspired me. There's people that talk to me that kind of, I guess, sparked me to talk about video games on YouTube. And th those people are uh, Robert and Wes of Gaming Off the Grid and uh, Alex of, uh, that, he's just one man, but that game collector on YouTube. Um, those are just two YouTube channels, small YouTube channels, but I, I know all those guys personally and they're all great dudes and, uh, yeah, they're all passionate about video games and every single one of those guys is like, they know a lot about like a specific like sector of video games. Like one guy I'll know a lot about Xbox and another guy I'll know a lot about like PlayStation one or another guy I'll know like PlayStation two or SNES or, you know, everyone's got their niche. And what would you consider your niche? Like the imports or, or anything like what specifically? Shooters, definitely the shooters. Uh, shoot 'em ups, shmups, or you know whatever you want to call them. That, that's 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 my thing, dude. I mean, I like a lot of different kinds of video games. Don't get me wrong. Um, growing up, I was really big into I was into RPGs like Lunar. Lunar specifically, that was like a game changer for me in uh, in high school. I'm almost forty years old. How old are you guys? 37. I just turned Okay, I mean, I saw the Beavis and Butthead avatar. I figure we're kind of we're kind of close to the same age here. So Yeah. Yeah, the shooters is where it's at for me. I, like I said, I've always liked video games. They've always been a huge part of my life. Um growing up with the shooters, like as far as like being addicted to a certain like kind of video game, that's definitely where it's at for me, the shoot 'em ups. Yeah, I love them too. How about, you know, specifically Bullet Hell? Like, you know, your cave shooters, Do Dodon Patchy games. Yeah, I mean, if, if you like shooters, I mean, cave. I mean, I'm actually wearing a cave t shirt right now. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um, yeah, cave, cave. That's a big name, man. Um, I, I love pretty much everything that they've ever made, except there's one game that's like, of course, you know, everything's like, you know, rare and expensive now, right? But there's one game that they actually made that I'm not uh, the hugest fan of, and that's Dodon Patchy Side Diojo. And that's just because the bullet patterns are like so thick and dense. And I've never, I'm not like great at these games to begin with, but I just, I can't get anywhere with this game. It's so fucking hard. Or excuse my language. It's so hard. What's the one that they ported on the PS2? It's like a lot of O's and U's. Well, there's, a few. there's a few they ported on the PS2. You have, um, uh, Mushihima, uh, Mushihima Sama. You had uh, Ibarra. You had Dodonpachi Diojo. That's the one. That's my favorite right there because I can't pronounce that. Diojo. Diojo. That's my favorite one. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. It's uh that's very very oh. similar to Katsu. If you've played Katsu, you know you kind of start in the city at night. It almost looks like Akira. It's it's just kind of neon and just like beautiful music. It's got a beautiful music, beautiful sprite work. Of course, Cave is known for their, their beautiful sprite work. That's my favorite. Cave. But look, where it's at for me, the biggest Cave game that has come out, just for me personally, the, the, it, uh, S. Prade. You know what I'm talking about? S. Prade? And you're kind of flying like a, like a, like a person. 
Yes. Like, kind of like a yeah, person you're, in a you're pretty pack. much a person now. It, what the what the heck does S parade mean, right? What is that like? I, this is a cave game. I actually have played. Like I played this game in the arcade when I was a kid. I actually had an arcade that, near me that actually had S parade in the in the late nineties that I played as a kid. So that's why that cave game specifically like really stands out to me, right? And so uh, we actually recently got a port of S parade to the PS4 and the Nintendo Switch. Of course, I, I had to have them both, but they're uh, they're part of the uh, the M2 line of shot triggers games that they have. Um, that they, they've recently added the Switch to their lineup, but they've pretty much ported everything to the PS4. Uh, now, just because we have it on the screen right now, if you're following with the footage, we're looking at these PS3 move games. I mean, it was like a Cabela's, uh, you know, one of the game hunters with like a grizzly bear on it, this medieval moves game. Uh, how did these hold up? You know, once you got these, you brought them home, you had the gun, you had the gun accessory. I mean, did they hold up? Like, were they worth the, Were they worth picking up? Dude, honestly, I haven't even played most of these yet. These are just... That was like the flavor of the month game thing for me. Um, now the PS3 Move controllers, I, I dig them for like uh, House of the Dead Overkill. Um, House of the Dead. Or, so when we talk about the PlayStation Move and Like on games, there's really only two games that we're really going to focus on here, and those yeah. those are House of the Dead Overkill and Time the Time Crisis trilogy, right? So let me just stop you there for a second. I have. House of the Dead 2 and 3 and House of the Dead over, like, Overkill on the Wii with the Nyko gun. I think you, you showed it in your video here somewhere. Uh, I have it with that. So I don't have the PS3 version, but I have the House of the Dead 2 and 3 and then Overkill on the Wii with the gun for that. So you think there's going to be one a... of the Wii guns as well, but I've heard that there's a PS3 version of that Nyko gun that's like incredibly rare and hard to find. I wish I had it, but I don't. Gotcha. Because I'm guessing there's only maybe a minor. I don't think it's going to be a massive difference between the ports on those. Even though the PS3 has better hardware, I don't know if it's going to be like night and day, the difference between playing those. Because like on the Wii, I have that 1080p adapter. So I'm wondering side by side. I mean, I'm sure it's a little clearer on the PS3 of those games. But the cool thing is you have the time crisis. I, that didn't get ported to the Wii. Yeah, the time crisis. I recently got uh, a gun and some of those inf the infrared sensors for the PS3. Now the guns are easy to find, but the sensors were, for whatever reason, are, like they were hard for me to find. So uh, I have this place. Uh, we were talking earlier on the phone, and I was going to tell you about this. There's, this, I'm very, very fortunate and lucky. I have this place. I'd say uh, maybe half an hour, forty minutes from me. This flea market, and they it's just it's like a place to like everyone just dumps like all their video games, and that's that's where I get like all my imports, like anything that I'm looking for. I put the feelers out, and I told the guys I wanted those sensors for the PS3, and within a week's time, he found some. And uh, I think he charged me like 20 or 25 bucks for them or something like that, which sounds like a lot, but on eBay, those things go for like even more than that. So. Absolutely, and that's the gun I got, by the way, that you're holding up right there. The Nyko perfect shot. Yeah, this is like flea market stuff for me. That yeah, this is all like flea market stuff. Right here. So you 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 have a lot of good luck with the flea markets because the ones by me are pretty picked over, and when they have games, it's like eBay prices. So talk about like what what they're like in your neck of the woods. Um. We got a few gaming stores in my neck of the woods. We have one called Region. That's actually they're moving. They're, they're like moving locations. They're moving from one mall to another mall, and they told me they were doing that because I guess uh, it's cheaper to operate in one mall and there's more foot traffic in another mall. I don't know, but there's that store which I really really like. But I don't. They're moving, so I'm probably not going to see them much anymore. But the flea market is staying, and that's where it's at. That's that's. That, that's where I get all my imports. For whatever reason, it's like a transit, transit, transient, transient area. A lot of people coming and going. So there's a lot of people from different countries, and they they trade their video games at this specific flea market. And uh, that's I've gotten shooters for like every system, like Dreamcast, PS2, like anything, you know. Absolutely, and. Uh, you know, it's so good to get a flea market because you can haggle. You know, like a lot of game stores. 
like it sounds like the one you have is 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 nicely priced, but a lot of game stores they just don't want to bend on those prices. They put it, they decide what they want is a is a price, and they don't really they don't really haggle, you know. Sometimes I would say that the game store, the flea market game store that I go to, is is probably it's they got to keep it uh, they got to keep it with online prices just because the store and when prices change they have to pay more f- when they bring product in you know what i mean and the place that i go there they're fair with people they don't like to jit people so if you have something that's worth money they want to give you at least if you got an expensive item they want to at least give you half of what that item's worth you know i i can't think of any other place that's going to even give you 20% of what something's worth like that, unless it's another collector, you know? Definitely not a pawn shop. Right, but yeah, this so this flea market, it's called Gamer's Paradise. It's in Joppa, Maryland. I will, I'll definitely promote it on my end, just because I, I believe, I love the place so much. Um, one of my homeboys used to be a manager there. He actually got fired, um, but I'm really close friends with the owner, so it's all good. But, dude, when my boy, his name's Doug. I don't know if he's listening right now. Um yeah, when he was there, like, oh my god, I was coming out of that place with bags and bags and bags of video games, like every day, dude. It was crazy. I had a t-shirt shop right up the street. Like any money that I made that day selling t-shirts, I would just take right to the flea market and get video games with. Not bad. That was my that was my routine, like every day. And this is a flea market that was open like, four days out of the week. So four days out of the week, I was coming home with bags full of video games. You know, and while we're still on with these, you know, these PlayStation Move, these light gen games, it's such a, it's such a, uh, it's, it's sad to me because one of the funnest fucking things you can do is get in an arcade. They have some where you kind of can go in inside and sit down in them and close the curtain and, and like pick up a gun and just have that one of those light gun arcade. It's one of the funnest things you can play because it's very interactive, of course, right? It's not just a joystick and some fucking buttons and a D-pad or something. You know, you pick up a light gun. Like, I can think of, like, you know, the Jurassic Park one. I don't know if you played that in the arcade. You go in there, you sit down, it's dark. You're sitting down, you feel like you're in a vehicle. It's an on-rail shooter. You're shooting at dinosaurs. I mean, yeah, the seat moves around, off. right? It pisses me off. There's not more of those, you know? For well, for um, you know, back when I got my NES, when, when my parents got me my NES, you know, that came with a light gun, so... My first memories of Lycon were, were weren't in arcade. It was more at home, but I, I definitely, you know, from I'm sure you've seen my YouTube channel by now. I, I definitely like Lycon stuff. Um, it's just another sector of gaming that uh, it's it's just a lot of fun. Like you said, it's very interactive. It, it's haptic. You're moving around. Um, yeah, it's not just it's not just like you staring at a screen. It's like you interacting with something. I think that's that's a big part of the fun of it. You know, right. And you know you got it's it's more than just like shooting a gun. You'll have your attachments. You're throwing grenades off of it. Um, you know, there's usually like a storyline. Like you know, Time Crisis. You know, they're they're giving you a little bit of dialogue. House of the Dead. They're giving you a little bit of dialogue. A story that interweaves. It's not just mindless, brainless shooting, right? Well, I mean, and, Overkill. Yeah, that's when they get kind of. He- I mean, that's the heaviest I think they ever got with the story was Overkill. Yeah. But they tried to make like a Tarantino movie, kind of. Right. I dig it though, man. It's fun. And, uh, you know, th- those are definitely some of my favorites. The House of the Dead 2 and 3 and Overkill on the Wii with that Nyko perfect shot. Really fun. Uh, feels just like the arcade. And, you know, when you're pointed at like a like a 60-inch flat screen uh, sitting on your couch, it's really fun. I just wish, you know, to, to my knowledge, do they even have... Is there even support for Light Gun now with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X? Okay, so here's there, there's something that I am following that it hasn't come out yet, but I'm I'm hearing some decent things about it. Um, there's that new retro game system that's supposed to have the Light Gun support for like PS1 and Saturn. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Uh it's it's supposed to use something called the Sendin Light Gun. It's for the it's it's a it's for a console that's kind of come under fire, just like all the other ones have. But it's like it's like a CD based emulation console that uses the Send in Like on. Um, yeah, yeah, like all your PS One and Saturn games are supposed to be able to use this new technology, like on a flat panel TV, without using a CRT through emulation. I think that that's that sounds awesome. I, I really love because I don't have a CRT. You know, I did when I was a kid, but as an adult, I do not have one. 
I have one. I have a Trinitron that actually sits on my porch. It's because it's such a it's such a um decor killer. You know what I mean? Like when when you have like a modern looking house and you throw a CRT in there, I mean, no disrespect, it just kind of kills the vibe. It's just like okay, like we're 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 modern, we're modern. Now we're in the nineties with the CRT. So what's cool too is like. I guess you can kind of put put them like in a cabinet and kind of be discreet with them, but yeah, I just keep mine on the fucking porch. You know, the first thing I do whenever I go into a new hotel room, what's that? I, I take the TV, flip that bitch on the side, and hook my switch up to it. There you go, Tate baby. <laughs> <laughs> I love when yeah. they're on a swivel in a hotel room because you can kind of swivel it to the right angle. Because sometimes they'll be like, you'll have like the bed, right? And then they put this like the, the TV like in a weird spot, like it's kind of in a, in a corner. And you're like, why would you put the TV over there? But anyways, yeah, I like when they're on a swivel too, and you can get to the connections in the back. Bro, when I get hotel rooms and start playing shooters, the cops get called. So <laughs> yeah, I get I get crazy with it. But yeah, the first thing I ever do. Uh, you know, sometimes we get, me and my woman, we actually get a hotel, like, every couple months, just, like, a mini vacation kind of thing, and, uh, we'll get home from work as we're getting this hotel, and she'll get home from work, and she'll see the TV, and, like, she's like, what in the hell are you doing, because she has no idea, you know? Now, um, you know, when you, so are you, uh, as a Switch player, are you docked more than you're portable? I'm 50-50. Right. I'm fifty fifty. I'm, 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 I'm more docked because I just like that big screen. But it is yeah, such a. I feel, I feel you. I feel you. I'm. I. I think that I'm more of a docked console player myself. But because of the way my lifestyle is right now, the fact that I can take that docked console anywhere with me and continue playing my game, that's a game changer. But that's not something new. Sony did this w- w- years before Nintendo. You know, Sony laid the groundwork for Nintendo for the With Switch, the Vita, right? right? Because the Vita was absolutely, so absolutely, absolutely, they did, and that's how I gamed for for many years before the Switch. You know, the Switch added a, the Switch did it right and made it convenient. That's what that's what it's Nintendo funny. did. It's funny that we're cutting to almost a decade later, right? And now, and now, Switch is the big news is OLED. And the Vita did it how many years ago? You know, 20, 2011. Yeah, that's great. That's so. So it's a decade. A decade later, and that's the you know that's crazy to me. Yeah, the game changer was the PS TV for me, and I bought a PS TV at launch. I bought another one when they were actually discounted all the way down to forty dollars, and uh, I still I still have all my original Vitas and PS TVs, and I have I have a few of each just because uh. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm not a crazy collector, but I was just big on the Vita and the PS TV because, like I said, I could dock it and play it on the TV and take it on the go. And for RPGs, because I'm an RPG player, too, um, yeah, that was just, that was the way I, I finished games like Cosmic Star Heroin and a lot of PS1 RPGs that I never played as a kid that I got to finish as an adult. Now, do you find you have the time... For RPGs, you know, with a busy life, you know, with a, with a, with a work schedule, do you have time like you used to to play them? Oh, you know, the answer to that is no. Yeah. The answer to that is no, but for certain RPGs, I will make time. And an example of that is is the new Yeez game that just came out. I just got it yesterday at Best Buy on my way home from work. And uh, I, I plan on starting that this weekend, and I plan on finishing it. It might take me a month or two to finish it, but I'm, I, it's one I'm going to play and finish. I might stream it. I might not. I don't know, but I am going to play it. Now, do you have a system that you have, you know, like the biggest library for? Like, what what stands out as your, as your heavy hitter big libraries as far as consoles go? Ooh. Now, right now oh, like man, I got a lot right to now, say here, boys. I got a lot to say here, boys. We're we're looking at your Super Nintendo right now. Is that one of the bigger or one of the smaller? Ah, uh, Super Nintendo is probably smaller. Okay. I, I, I probably I'm not a, now. I don't have giant collection of video games. Like when I like each system, like I try to get all the shooters for every system, which I don't have or anything like that. But that's what I go after. So it's smaller collections of niche games for every system or systems that i like anyway 
Right. You know, the the Super Nintendo, that's one of those that when you look at five years ago, the prices, and you look at now, some of them are up double, even triple. I know, like, some of that stuff's crazy, like the Saturn stuff. And all the PS1, like, recently, dude, the PS1 and, like, the GameCube. Dude, the PS, dude, like, I, like all them RPGs and stuff, where I got, like, 5 and $10 and, like, 20 bucks at the flea market, stuff like that. Like, and now they're, like, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's crazy. Now, when you're, when you're, because you're, I'm noticing you're showing Super Famicom and Super Nintendo. Do you have a separate, do you have a, a Super Famicom and a Super Nintendo, or is yours modded that you pulled that, that plastic piece off so you can play both? Yeah, I think my Super Nintendo, what I did was, I think I just took some pliers and, like, just ripped the two plastic pieces out so I could just play the, see that game right there on the screen? Yeah. Across Scramble Valkyrie? That's the game right there that I modded my SNES for, right there. That's gotcha. one of my favorite shooters of all time right there that you're seeing on the screen right now. Do you see that? Yep. It's a beautiful thing, boys. Did, now, 100 did, bucks. That's what I paid for that. You see that? 100 bucks. Oh I my paid goodness. it. I don't even think that game's worth that, but I wanted to play. I bought that at a convention for 100 bucks, dude. And it was kind of yellow, too. I'm not trying to rub that in. I didn't care. I wanted to play it that oh, bad. Bucks. Bro, when I'm feeling a game and you got it in front of me, I'll I'll kick the money out. That ain't a thing, baby. You know, when, when we're talking shooters for like the Super Nintendo, were some of these arcade ports or were these straight to console uh, releases? Um, you know, mainly with shooters. Mainly, uh, well, I don't know. It's a mix of both, honestly, because a lot of the Dojin stuff doesn't it go straight to pc some of the dojin stuff actually goes straight to arcades in japan um you know i i i my a big thing that i collected years ago that uh it's not so much of a thing anymore physically it is digitally are dojin shooters from like comicet like comicet these are um i'm trying to think of how should, they're like small like anime conventions in japan that like people that make their own comic books and their own like computer programs and they kind of all get together and kind of sell their stuff yeah and, uh, yeah i would just find people like online like online retailers that would sell that kind of stuff from conventions like comic and i collected that stuff for years and i got a pretty big collection of that kind of stuff and it's something that i think i should start talking about more on youtube um i have a little bit but I used to be a lot more passionate about it. It's just the time now, you know? See, if you got a pet peeve for the same thing I do when it comes to a shoot 'em up, when there's no rapid fire, like when you have to keep pressing the button, I fucking, I can't stand that. Oh, I gotta God. Well, you, gotta, you need turbo. If you got like some kind of a turbo option, then, you know, you can yeah. really with that. Like a lot of arcade games, that's, that, that's an arcadey thing, you know? Console ports, like if it's a good shooter and it's a console port, there's you should never have to do that. You know, keep tapping the button. That's crazy. Because it, yeah, it kills the thumb. I mean, you give yourself arthritis with some of those games. You the, the way that like that they would not think to add, you know, rapid fire is crazy. Like if you're gonna keep hitting the button, you might as well be playing a light gun game, right? Because you're shooting something. Yeah. Like you're hitting a button, like a light gun game, not a shoot 'em up. You know what I had to do with a lot of my Super Nintendo games, because because I'm seeing, like, the backs would yellow. So what I would end up taking was a sports game that would be, like, a buck, like an NCAA basketball, some throwaway garbage game. Right. Pop the backs. Because for whatever reason, sometimes the back would yellow and not the front. So it would basically make a, make a game mint again. So my thing is this, like, whatever condition the game is when I find it, I just try to keep it in that condition. Like, if it's all cruddy and messed up, then that I'd try to keep it that way. Any type of original stickers it has on it, I try yeah. to keep them on there. So if it has GameStop, but what, like, a, like a disc only, right? So you got a disc game, and it's, like, plastered with GameStop stickers. You're going to leave those on? Yeah, I got, I got some stuff right now. I'd show you, like, some... I got like Tron Bonds on PS1, Sakoden 2s and stuff I could probably show you that you I you know you'd probably be like John what the hell you know. <laughs> but them stickers man, I like them stickers cuz it reminds me of like where I got the game from, you know. Well, that's funny cuz I the reason I asked that is cuz we get two types of collectors that we interview. You know, you got your you got yours that that have to get everything off of Goo Gone and make it look mint again or some that just kind of let it let it roll. 
just let you know, let those uh let those stickers fly, you know. Well, I'm a I'm a gamer that likes to play my video games, so I'm not I'm not really like a collector as much as I am like I, like I'm like a hardcore like shooter lover, I guess. <laughs> I seen that Truxton. I seen that Truxton in your collection. Tell us the story about when you got that. Truxton, I just a flea market find, just like everything that else. One, that ain't cheap these days. Truxton, I think when I got Truxton. I, that's not a really expensive game now. I think card only maybe 40, 50 bucks. I mean, I guess that's a lot for a Genesis card, but I mean, if you think about it in terms of it's a decent shooter, I mean, 40, 50 bucks is pretty good money in 2021, you know? So I'm looking up that right now. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's not that bad. It's saying only 60. You know right, what I'm 60 bucks. Maybe is, uh, is, um, Musha is the one I'm thinking of. Oh God. Well, see, all right. So I, and there are differences between the versions, but if you want to play Musha, obviously you'd probably download the ROM and play it. But uh, right, Aleste, you know Aleste. That's that's the Japanese version. Now I'm looking at price charting. Say you had Truxton Complete, that's going for 160. With the clam, that's actually not too 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 bad. What about Grindstormer? What's that going for? Grindstormer. That's my jam. That's like my favorite Genesis oh, shooter. Ninety, complete. Ninety, yeah, complete. That's a that, that game. You're gonna have to have that one complete because it has a beautiful, beautiful artwork. So much better than the Japanese artwork, and with that's what's rare, right? Usually we got the crappy artwork, but on Grindstormer we got the better artwork. On uh, Gyarus we got the better artwork, right? Uh, I'm trying to think, those are the only two games that come to mind. Everything else we got shit on, but Guy RS and uh, Grindstormer, bro. We got the better artwork. What are the, the 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 ones that a lot of people say that are? It's like, and there was like a third and a fourth one. Was it like Thunder Lightning something? Thunder Force. Those were those were the considered kind of the classics on the Genesis, right? For shoot 'em ups. What yeah, like I think Thunder. I mean, for me, Thunder Force. Th- Three is probably ah, three and four. Th- four is called Lightning Force, right? Lightning Force Thunder, Lightning Force Quest for the Dark Star. You have a better re- memory of that than I do. I can never keep the name straight. Yeah, so there was there was there. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about the original Thunder Force, but then there was Thunder Force two on the on the Mega Drive or Genesis, and that um. It had sections, certain levels were like free roaming, so you can go up, down, left, and right. I was not a fan of that. I like the rail, like all, I like to be on rail, you know, whether it be vertical, horizontal. I don't want to go in every direction. I want you to throw me in the direction I'm going, and I want to shoot stuff. Right. So, then they came out with Thunder Force 3, which was, that was the standout game for me, and I think they probably perfected it with Thunder Force 4, but uh, we got it as Lightning Force uh, here in the in the U.S., and then Thunder Force 5, uh, Working Designs, ported that uh, to the PS, it was a PS1 and Saturn uh, port. I think it was an arcade game originally, and it got ported to the PS1 and Saturn, and Working Designs released that uh, here in the U.S., and then Thunder Force 6 came out uh, in arcades in Japan and on, on the PS2 uh, in Japan. And uh, I got a version of that. It's actually a pretty good game. It's the last one I know of that came out in the series as well. Now, how about like uh, a little bit more of an obscure 90s console like a Turbo Graphics? How do you feel about some of the shoot 'em ups on there like your Air Zox? Oh, God. <laughs> That's like one of the... So the PC engine and the and the Turbo Graphics. That's uh, I have a lot of memories growing up with the Turbo Graphics. Uh, you know, not a lot of people can say that. Um, right. I never personally owned one, but I had a babysitter when I was growing up that had a boyfriend that had one, and he would let me play his Turbo Graphics. You know what always made me want one was the Bonk games. Yeah, the Bonk because, games. I, I love the Bonk games. I own some of the Bonk games like to this day. Like I own uh I own the PC engine version of them. I don't own the, the, the Turbo Graphics version, but uh I do have the mini, the mini system. The one that Konami put out. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty it's got uh 
the CD based emulation on there. You got the Hue card and uh, Turbo Chip uh, emulation on there. It's got you got pretty much all your heavy hitters on that one system. Dude, six years ago, I picked up a Turbo Graphics just on eBay, a hundred bucks. I see them going for like three hundred dollars now. Yeah, they go at the flea market. They they have them at the flea market um, out my way. They they're they're about a hundred bucks for a Turbo Graphics in twenty twenty one. That's a good price on the market because uh, I don't know why they're going for that. Like with the if you get them with the controller and the adapter and that power boost thing for the back that makes it RCA. Oh uh, yeah, well if you add all that stuff in there, you're 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 yeah, you're bumping it up to like three hundred bucks probably. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying sold listings because that's what I go by when I when I try to see what stuff's kind of gone up to. I go by the sold, not what they're asking. Oh uh, yeah, th- so I haven't really checked online uh, sales for stuff like that in a while. I just kind of see what things cost and like the sticker prices on like certain systems, like here and there, you know. <clears throat> and I haven't really seen a lot of people buying Turbo Graphics games like at all. Um, yeah. So the prices really don't go up or down; they just kind of stay the same, at least out my way. On on stuff like the Turbo Graphics, I think the decision to put those um those shoe cards. CD cases was a very poor decision because I think a lot of those, when people got rid of them, got mixed in with music CDs and just, you know, went to fucking Nowheresville. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, like a Genesis clam, that's going to stick out. Even, like, a Sega CD, like, that's a fucking huge-ass fucking case, right? Uh, uh, Turbo Graphics CD case is going to disappear the fuck in like a you know a bargain bin of like old green day CDs. You know, you know it's going to disappear. <laughs> yeah, and like you know finding those things complete and in this day and age like unless they're new is is pretty you know cuz they had I guess there was like the CD case and then they actually had like a uh at least the CD based games they actually had like a piece of cardboard like a cardboard case like outside of that even, right? Right. And uh that's not something you see a lot of in 2021. Where are you finding a lot of these? Because uh, you, I'm guessing you're having to go online for some of these more uncommon shoot 'em ups on the Switch. Are some of these limited run? What's your? Uh, yeah, all the all the new Switch stuff is pretty much just like pre ordered uh, stuff that I pre ordered, you know, from whatever website they're coming out on. Do you ever take so, a? Do you have anything like for arcade? Like, uh, do you have like any like like a main machine or anything, a cabinet, or is everything kind of console run? Like, what what do you play? Like, when you what do you want to do? Like, some like you know more arcade based shoot 'em ups that haven't been ported to a disc. What do you do for that? Probably retro arc. Retro arc. Yeah, retro arc. What what do you run it on? My PC. Right off your PC. Okay. And do you stream that way? Sometimes. Okay, and then when I when I stream that way, I just screen grab, you know. Yeah, yeah, I screen grab the uh, you know, off the PC. You ever you ever had a Pi before? Yes. Yeah, we use um, when we stream, we tend to use the Pi Four because it can do even Dreamcast now and runs even N sixty four pretty good. And uh, obviously, you know all the all the main stuff, um. But that's our go-to way usually. But PC, I mean, same deal. Yeah, I used to. Uh, I had a Raspberry Pi for a while, but I, I don't know why I got away from it. I just, for whatever reason, I'm just drawn to RetroArch on the PC, and then just that's just yeah. the way I roll for at least for arcade games anyway. It's whatever works, you know. Whatever's comfortable for for you. But what are some of your like if, like prized possessions in your collection? Prize gaming possessions. Uh, probably my C. I have a sealed Crimson Clover. That's probably my prized gaming possession right there. I'm not even familiar with that game. Oh, it's the best best shooter ever. It's my favorite I know, shooter. On Jet Song. Crim- oh, it got ported to the Switch. It recently got ported to the Switch. So there's no reason not to play it. Crimson Clover. Crimson and Clover, like the like the Joan Jet Song. I, I guess it's just Crimson Clover. Just a shooter called Crimson Clover. It's it's uh, it's a Dogen 
shooter, PC shooter. It's trapped on the PC for years. Just got ported to the Switch. It got ported to uh, Steam. I want to say maybe in 20, a decade ago or so. Uh, and just recently got ported to the Switch. And it's, uh, it's just an amazing shooter called Crimson Clover. Are there any games that they could be valuable or they could be, you know, very common or, you know, cheap games that like, is there any stand out that you just go to and play a lot that they're just personal favorites that maybe you, your favorites that kind of blow off steam to, or, you know, like your, your go-to games, like any, any personal favorites that stand out among like a lot of different consoles, like what comes to mind? You know, you said ESP raid. Um, yeah, that game you're seeing on the screen. So I'm actually, I have that like playing like on my TV in the background right now. Um, so that'd be one of them. Yeah, that's probably, yes, yeah, that's it. S. Parade, Crimson Clover, uh, Battle Traverse, um, Striker. I like a lot of games in the Striker series. You know, Striker's 1945, uh, 2, uh, 2 and 3. Yeah, 1, 2, and 3. For me, my go-tos are like... I usually do the beat. The beat em ups are the feel good ones for me. Like, you know, you go to your Streets of Rage 2 and 3. You know, even, even like fighting games, you know, your Street Fighter Champion Edition, your Mortal Kombat's. Um, you know, like like when you get you get into your four player beat em ups, like your Simpsons, X Men Arcade, like the Turtle, the Turtles Arcade and Turtles in Time. Like those for me are just kind of like, I love when you have that mindless fun. You can kind of shut your brain off, beat up some sprites, forget about what you're doing. Those are my. Yeah, I think beat them ups are good for that. They really are. Some people will say they're repetitive, but they're not for me because you know you keep changing levels. You have boss fights. I like um, the combo heavy ones, the ones that have like the combo heavy combat systems. Those are at least for me. Those are the ones that are more, I guess, addictive. I'm trying to think what other what other ones would be kind of um there's one that came out recently. It's called uh Fight and Rage. It came out on the I think Switch and PS4. Um it's like one of those sprite based uh beat 'em ups, but I've I've been having a lot of fun with that uh recently. Fight and Rage. I think it recently got a physical release as well. Are there any systems that, you know, because I, I talk to a lot of people that I like to talk about, like, consoles that you love, but there's consoles that some people just don't understand. Like, I, I, Master System has never, never done dick for me. I just never liked that console. I love the fuck out of the Genesis. I just don't like the color palette of the Master System. I don't know what it is. It never did anything for me. Is there a console that doesn't speak to you? Uh... Yeah, I mean, see, as a kid, I love the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, but as an adult, it does not speak to me. Yeah, it just looks like you got to use your imagination for everything. Right, as a kid, the Nintendo Sixty Four was a great system, very uh, mind blowing. But as an adult, it doesn't really do much for me. Very blocky. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the N Sixty Four, very blocky. I mean, it's got a huge cult following, and the people that they love the '64, they really love it. But I just, as an adult gamer, like I've tried to, I just, I can't do it. Twenty six hundred two is like a lot of bleeps and bloops sounds. It's almost like you're, it's almost like a mockery. Like it's like a, you turn it on. It looked horrible. It looks and sounds horrible. I mean, there's there's no way around it. It's just I don't see. I guess they had the the Retron seventy six or something like some kind of emulation based atari console i I guess if you were gonna that'd be the way the route you want to go down um if you were to do that but there's some that are okay like your your pitfall the the gremlins game i kind of don't mind there's like a star wars arcade that didn't get a bad port it looks halfway decent for what it is but yeah a lot of it's just like i mean you play et and you're like what the fuck you fall in that pit the controller, bro. The the controller is so. Oh my god. Yeah. It feels like a, like a. Uh, 
like a like a clutch in a shitty car or something. It feels oh, like a... it's awful. Oh, there was a game. There was a shooter actually that I liked on the twenty six hundred River Raid. That's a good one. Yeah, that was like that was like the only Atari game that I, that thing that was like the, the that's the start. That was like one of the games that started me uh, on shoot 'em ups was uh, River Raid. River Raid and uh, yeah, I think River Raid, and then I didn't really play much shooters until uh, you know the Super Nintendo days. I kind of got back in there a little bit. And it's so funny, like when you, <laughs> when you would get a port in Atari, right? That was in the arcade, and it would just look like a fucking just a trash of, of what what they were trying to do. Like at least when you got the NES, right? Say you play Galaga, right, in the arcade. When you play the NES game, you know what you're still playing. It still looks like Galaga. Like like just think about like when they ported Pac Man, the original Pac Man. Well, they fixed it a little on the 2600. It was just like, uh, no. Oh, God. The NES had, like, had its own style, had its own, like, color palette and its own sound yeah. chip. You know, the NES had its own thing going, and and it it, it, it was its thing, and it was, it was respected. Those, the NES is, like, respected, at least to me. Anything before that, like, nah. I just can't, I can't get down with it. Like the twenty six hundred, I get it, you know, I, I get it for its time, but you know, I just, I think that the, the a cool one is that uh, that vector based uh, gaming system, what's it, the Vectrex? I think that thing's pretty cool. Vectrex is cool, and you can do those little layout, those little screen, plastic screen layouts on there. Yeah, my father, God rest his soul, my father had a, a friend growing up that uh, he had a Vectrex in his garage, and I just remember like, kind of playing with it as a kid. I don't have like tons of memories uh, messing with one or anything like that, but I just remember it being a gaming console where there's a TV attached to it, and I always thought that was kind of weird. And it's also kind of like in a vertical orientation, so I think that's kind of interesting. Have you gotten to do any like collaborations with any other channels uh, through doing YouTube? Meet any yeah, cool people? Basically, like friends of mine, though, like gaming off the grid. I've done some stuff with them. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure I've done some stuff with some other people. It's just I can't I can't think of it if I have off the top of my head. But yeah, just uh, if I've done anything, it's either been gaming off the grid or uh, Dad Game Collector and. Uh, there's people like that. And... I'm friendly with a lot of channels, but I haven't really like uh, made content with a lot of channels, so to speak. It's hard. It's hard to... Everybody's on their own schedule. Everybody's busy. Yeah, I, I wish I had more time, man. I wish I had more time to, 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 to meet people and mingle and, and collaborate with. I think that'd be awesome. It's definitely a, a lot of fun, but... Uh... Work and life and 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 the, and the the rat race of life, man. It's just where's the time for that, you know? Sure. Even right now, I'm looking. It's like, oh my god, it's all it's it's almost eleven o'clock, and I I'm thinking of all the stuff that I got to get done tomorrow. And uh, all right, yeah, it's never and ending, man. Is, like the funny thing is, like you're legitimately busy, right? But some people just like to use that word as a cop out, right? They're saying I'm busy, but then they're sitting on their ass watching fucking Dancing with the Stars or something, right? They're like. It's must like be nice. Pot. You know must it, you know. Nice. <laughs> Bro, I work. I, look, I'm a, I'm a, I work on my feet. I work in logistics, right? So, yeah. I, it, dude, and I'm working like these 80, 90 hour weeks now. It's just, it's hard on me. It's hard on my body. It's hard on my mind. Um, you know, I, I, we all have every job, you know. Anyone has has its own sets of challenges and and, and and stuff that you have to meet, but uh, you know, right now, just with my specific job, it's 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 just oh, it's just taking up so much time in my life. But it's not always going to be like that. It's just the way things are right now, you know. And that's why it's good that we all have video games for an escape, you know. 
That's what it is, dude. That's it. video games is my biggest escape. Is there a point in the future that you see maybe yourself slowing down? Are you getting to like, you know, do you have an end goal? Like, you know, when I was, I'll give you an example. When I was kind of getting into action figures and shit, the eighties and nineties figures, I always had some kind of end goal in sight because I knew I was never going to be a completionist, right? Because it just doesn't make sense for your wallet. So I always had the figures I wanted and then the figures I knew I was going to just avoid because you can't have everything. And it's kind of like a console, right? You go in and you try to pick and choose what you really fucking need because when you get to the point when you're just getting fillers, then you're, you're, a lot of times your wallet can't keep up, right? So you got to pick and choose, you know, deals, sales, uh, what you really want to have in your collection. Uh, do you do you have that kind of end goal? Like, are you, are, you, are you happy with where you're at on some of the consoles? Are some of the consoles you're kind of closing in on? You're like, I don't really need any more games for this. I'm good. I don't need any more games, honestly. If if one a new one comes out and it looks good, I'll get it. If not, I'm good, dude. Well, a lot of collectors will say some shit like, I'm never done, right? They'll say, I'm never, I'll am never, never be done collecting. When I'm dead, I'm, I'll be done collecting. But at the same time, doesn't it kind of lose its meaning if you never stop? If you never stop, then what the fuck is it then? It's an endless pursuit of material possessions, right? If, if, you, if you set out to just get the titles that mean a lot to you, then it can hold its meaning. If you're just if you're just looking for every kind of deal you can get or just whatever you can to add, you know, pieces to the po- the puzzle every week, isn't it kind of like uh for nothing, you know? It's like what gives it the meaning is do the games mean something to you at the end of the day? Are they games that you really want to play? If they're games I don't play, I usually get rid of them. Right. Because why have them waste space if you're not going to play them? Do you have a lot of games in your backlog that you've been meaning to play? I mean, yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, dude. A lot of RPGs, honestly. Right. Because there's some... the ones I don't have the time to play. Yeah. And then you have some like that are imports that they need like a translation to be able to. Yeah, there are. There's some. There's some imports that I that I'm really really passionate about, like um, like Super Robot Ties and OG Saga Endless Frontier. Uh, that had a sequel, Super Robot Ties and OG Saga. Um. Frontier XC that only came out in Japan, but a group called um, Absolute Zero, I think, is the name of the group. They actually did an English translation of that game that you can uh, you can play through a DS emulator. Um, it's kind of it kind of sucks using a DS emulator, but there are some pretty good ones like the Drastic DS emulator. That's probably the, the that, that's my favorite. Um, But I think there's like some type of way that you can um, use like an R4 card and you can kind of inject ROMs into your DS and play them that way. Is Do you know anything about that? Oh, I have no idea because I, I only recently finally got a, a, a new 3DS XL. And that's one of the first handhelds I've had since fucking having a Game Boy in the 90s. So yeah, John, I, was I had the uh, R4 card for the 3DS XL and it wasn't bad. Can you play? Yeah, yeah, but you can play DS games on a 3DS XL using the R4 card, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the, so um, I have the ROM. I'd be more than happy to to share that with you guys. Um, I actually have it on a. Uh, you know what a GPDXD is? Or no, GPD One? GPD One? I, I have a GPDXD. I think the go-to now is the GPDX, GPDXD Plus because it has the Bluetooth, but. Um, that's what I use to emulate DS with, just because it's a, it's it's a simple Android interface. You've got a so I just saw your a little bit of your Switch collection there. You got a, a pretty large Switch collection 
you know, what do you, what do you do to get around those prices? Right. Because when he comes to, when it comes to first party switch games, the best you get sometimes is 10 bucks off at Best Buy, you know? I, oh God. Well, there, there's certain things that we said that we're not going to talk about on the podcast. So, but, I, but I will say this, uh, when dealing with video games, I like to use the barter system. Right. So that's, I won't go any further than that. <sighs> but yeah, like, let's just say, uh, you know, you have a game uh, that, that you want and I have a game that I want and we trade, you know? Right. To so trade amongst friends. Trading amongst friends. That's how I get around the high prices. And, uh, you know, and even on the, cause on the secondhand market, when, when people, uh, I cannot afford the price of video games. Now, let me get, I, I can only obtain the games that I have through the flea market and through, like I said, trading with friends. I know it's that bad now. And I, and if it's a deal, I never like, I pride myself in, in hooking people up. Like if you get something from me, I want you to leave the transaction thinking john just hooked me the fuck up that's how i get down with p and that's why people love me out here people that deal with me they they love dealing with me because that's how i treat people you know what do you Um, like about youtube what do you not like about youtube uh about youtube well i love about youtube there's not much i don't like about youtube but uh the thing i like the most about youtube is the people that i've met off of youtube right that's what i love the most um uh i think it's cool that if you if you have a, like a big channel i think i think it's cool that uh <coughs> you can make a little you can make a little bit of money off your channel if you monetize it i think that's kind of cool but i don't think begging for money on the internet's cool though i think just the idea of the the, the youtube monetization i think that's kind of an interesting concept yeah, because it's like there's so many sponsorships now, right? You notice that that that, that change. I think that's cool too. If you have a channel and, and and you get to the point where somebody wants to sponsor your content, I I think that that's a pretty cool thing. And I think there's a lot of people in 2021 that hate on that kind of thing, and they just say, "Well, this the person's e bagging," and right. and look at you know. I think there's a lot of people that hate on that kind of thing, and I think there's something that, you know. I think that there are people that you know, like the like the the DSPs and stuff like that of the world, right? Yeah, they beg for money on the internet, but um, I think it's cool when someone has a small channel and it grows, and they're passionate about video games, and you grow to the point where somebody wants to sponsor your content. I say, go for it, man. I think people like. Uh laugh at it sometimes because it's like here's my new here's my review of the new uh, Mario Golf on Switch but first let me tell you about manscaping and shaving your balls like it's like it's I like think weird, that's horrible it's like a weird segue you know it's a little odd sometimes now if you sponsor a product wouldn't it be something that you would want to talk about right. I'm going to give you an example like, um, like if you're, let's say if you're a golfer, right, and you're really passionate about golf clubs, and this guy's like, hey, I got this new golf club, I'll send it to you for free, you try it out. If you like it, talk about it on your YouTube channel. You know, if, if you don't, obviously, if you don't, you think it's a piece of crap, I would still want you to talk about it, because even if you say bad things, people are probably still going to buy it anyway, right? Because right. they know about it, right? So, you know, so I, I just think the concept of that is is interesting, you know. Something, you know, has value, you know, to an advertiser because it has an audience. Um, I think that that, that's an interesting concept, but I think the core values behind that are, to me, are just meeting people off the internet and just developing those friendships and those, those connections and building a network that way. That's like the core, that's like, you know, like 2008 YouTube. Yeah, and you know, it's like, it's like the way we, the way we select people for the show. Like there could be a channel that if if they have twenty thousand subs, that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have them on, even though we're a small channel. Even though, because we gotta think, we gotta we gotta first decide: do we even like this channel? I, we can tell right away you're a cool guy. We we stand behind your content. You're you you know you're uh you know you know a lot about game history, your collection. You know you can just tell by the the passion. The passion is behind the videos, right? But say like uh, 
there's this whole new trend on YouTube in our community with the retro gaming uh, of what I like to call like a TMZ gossip channel, right? Where they like to kind of spread rumors and controversy uh, for views sake. So we, we've had like channels that maybe are 20,000 subs that we, we, we could be in talks with about having them on the show. But if, if we don't, if we don't agree from a moral standpoint of what they're about, we don't have them on. And, it, and, and I don't care if it could give us a boost and maybe make us bigger because we are an under 500 sub channel. But that's just how we do it. And maybe we could be bigger if we did that, but we don't play ball like that. I just feel like for me, if it's a bigger channel, I'm, I'm less apt to watch it because I just feel like smaller channels like are more like it's like real, like real content as right. opposed to something like being manipulated, you know? And it's like what happens, like, John, it's like what happens to a rock band, right? When they're on their second or third album, like, they're all, like, coked out with, like, hookers and blow. And, like, they're they're not hungry anymore, right? You know, like, when a musician does not hungry anymore, they phone the fucking record in, right? It's not their good record. They call it the sophomore slump when a band puts out a a, a second album, right? It's like that's what happens to some of these channels maybe when they blow up. Like they stop really giving a fuck, and money a little bit of money's coming in. They're kind of yeah, you can see there's right? a lot of them that coast. Like oh, there, there's so many of them that are coasting right now. I do yeah. see. I don't. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to gossip about people though. But uh, you, you can just see there's so many of them that are coasting. I think the reason that they do coast is I think that they, 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 I guess that's how they make their living is off the channel. So. I yeah. guess they haven't figured out how to use that in the segue into something else, so they just try to coast off the YouTube. Maybe I don't know. And it's like we're not naming names, but but we can. I think a lot of us know who we're talking about, but we're not even naming. We don't even need to name names. Yeah, you can just see it. You know, know what kind of what kind of channels we're talking about. And it's just like if your channel, the main intention is to create controversy or gossip. That's not what any of us are in this for to begin with. You know? That's not the the reason we're supposed to be here is for the love of gaming and networking. Yeah, when it comes to controversy and gossip, there are, like, things on YouTube I watch for that, but it has nothing to do with gaming. Like, I like to watch those guys that bust, like, those creepy people that try to mess with kids. I like I like seeing them yeah. get busted online. Like, that's, like, controversial, you know? Like, when I want to see stuff like that's the type of stuff I watch when I want to see controversy, you know? But watching people beat up on video game channels isn't, uh... I used to kind of, you know, get in that here and there, you know? But it's... You know, if it's not positive, you know, it's... I don't, I don't got time for it. I'm a busy man, you know? Yeah, it's like... It's like those those channels are trying to do that to just get cheap views, you know? Like, they're trying to stir the pot just to get views when there's when there's there may or may not be any truth there. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's all about your intentions. Like, even if you are stirring the pot, like if you're just trying to like make a community and like meet people, and uh, you know, as long as as long as you're not you know manipulating people to do something awful, you know, if you, if you're just trying to find your community, I say go for it. Like, as long as you're not hurting anybody, you know. But, like, uh, you know, like a gossip thing, like a TMZ thing, yeah. I don't necessarily think that that's a, a bad thing because I do think that there's a lot of good that can come from constructive criticism. But, again, where, that's, there's a fine line there. What's, what's constructive criticism and what's, you know, like something like harassment or degradation or something along those lines, right? Very true. Are you an anime guy? Oh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I've seen you hold up that Ghost in the Shell there, which is based on the anime movie. What did you think of the What did you think of the live action Ghost in the Shell? The live action Ghost in the Shell, yeah, that came out. Oh, that that girl that played in uh, no, yeah, I did see that. I did see the live action Ghost in the Shell. I, I remember not really thinking much about it though. Yeah, I remember not thinking it being great, but not thinking it being bad either. It was just kind of like blah. 
That's kind of how it I wasn't felt. anything like the like what the original Ghost in the Shell that I remember though. Yeah. But the Ghost when we talk about Ghost in the Shell though, we have to talk about the excellent PS1 game. Also got a PSP release, right? PSP release as well, yeah. Uh, standalone complex. Third but, yeah, that PS1 game in particular though, uh studio that worked on that they just really knew how to program on the ps1 and uh, when it came to 3d based physics on the ps1 uh, a good example of how to play a game in a 3d space on the ps1 is ghost in the shell was it a third person shooter yes right you're like inside of this little robot and you like crawl around it's like a little like it's like a high speed kind of tank Kind of thing you can crawl around, sur- up and down surfaces, and, and yeah, it's a third person shooter. Yeah. Do you dig third person shooters like you know your Gears of War, your Mass Effect games? No, but I think they're cool though. But no, uh, I'm I'm almost forty years old, so like when I think of third person shooters, uh, I mean a Doom. I played a lot of Doom growing up. You know, I was uh, you know uh, Doom, Hex, and Heretic. Uh, I played a lot of first-person shooters in the '90s as a kid on PC. All the, all, uh, you know, Wolfenstein. Everything when it came out, I, I played. Uh, as far as shooters go, 3D shooters. Um, but I, I think that that was like a very. Was that a train? Is that a train? Train. Like a real train? Yeah. Interesting. Coming by. Yeah, that, uh, I used to live in Baltimore. I lived in a place called Greektown in Baltimore, and I had a train yard right behind this row house that I lived in. And uh, at, at that time, I was big into writing graffiti, so I worked at a nightclub, and I'd get off work at like 2 a.m., and I'd uh, catch a cab home, and I'd just you know spray paint, spray paint, you know, uh, pack, you know, chipping containers all night, you know. And, My uh, problem is uh, I, I, I uh, took this DeLorean back to the 1800s and I ran out of fuel. And uh, <laughs> I now is uh, connect to this train so I can get to 88 miles an hour and get back to the future. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. No, I just happen to be uh, working somewhere. There's a train that comes by every hour. Yeah, that sound, uh, it just reminded me of that. I lived in Baltimore when I used to spray paint these shipping containers behind this like train yard. And, uh, there's a couple of different train yards in Baltimore, actually, now that I think about it. But uh, I live in the country now. I'm nowhere, I'm nowhere near the city, even though I'm a Baltimore retro gaming. I'm a... Uh, Right next to Baltimore. But, it's uh, funny how much shipping how much shipping is still done by train. I mean, you know, it's like uh you know, what are we gonna have people go to dinner still on a horse? You know, like Well cargo. There's yeah. cargo and then a shipment. It's weird how there's the cargo is on boat and a shipment is on land. Let me just say they sound or they sound the opposite. Horrible. They they sound horrible. Like it sounds like almost like a plane that's been ridden into the ground. Like you know how they say all the the whole airline industry, like all the planes are extremely fucking outdated. When these trains come by, they screech and fucking squeal like a motherfucker. Like like you need to fucking spray them down with some WD forty. They just look like rust. They bunks. do, don't they? They sound like a like a horrible metal wreck. Like kind of just yeah, yeah. That's what it sounds it's like, like. It's like you gotta wonder, like, do they ever fucking you know, uh, keep those up. Do they ever like, what do you call it? Modify them? Not modify, like keep them up to code or anything. Is there it's any like regular the trains there? are like the same trains that like that movie, the warriors, you know, it's like the, yeah. the trains are the same. They were back then, you know, <clears throat> like they're running those subways in New York still that are really outdated. Sure, we got the light rail out here. We got the subway. Then we got the light rail, which is like the subway, but like above ground, right? The light rail. Yeah. That thing screeches too. I haven't been on a light rail or a subway in many years, though. It's been many years since I've ridden. Uh... 
Baltimore public transportation. But that used to be how I got around, though. Well, the classic in, 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 in at least in Manhattan would be as soon as the doors open, I mean, it's like a free for all elbow fest to get a fucking seat. And it's like you're, you're, you're hitting like grandma's in the head to get a seat. You know, it's like uh, it's, it's the most backstabbing shit you've ever seen. And then there's like the, the, the shame fest of whoever didn't get a seat has got to hold the pole. Cause otherwise you're going to fall the fuck down in your face when the, when the, when it, the subway abruptly stops. So it's a very funny thing. And then you'll sometimes stand outside of a of one of the subway doors that looks like kind of empty. So you're like, oh shit, finally I can get a seat. You go in there, there's a hobo laying down. It smells like shit in there. And that's why there's nobody in there. And then you're like, oh, I'm not getting a seat here either. That's that's the kind of the set the scene in New York. Yeah, Baltimore is like, you know, the subway, you know, you at night, you know, there might be somebody smoking crack on the subway and it, yeah. it's it's just it's pretty bad. <laughs> pretty bad but, here in Baltimore, you know. Then then and then in New York you get once you're seated, you're like, um, okay, now how am I gonna get harassed? Um what happens is your beggars come in then. Now they're doing like fucking somersaults and gymnastics and they got their change cup and they're like let me get a dollar or like some terrible fucking musician they can't sing fucking uh playing some song it's just basically a beggar fest or then you'll go you'll go you'll go walk down the street in manhattan somebody's trying to sell you their piece of shit mixtape and they can't rap for fuck uh or they they actually they, there was a, a a con they had going where a lot of people in, in new york they were saying, buy my mixtape, the motherfucker were giving you a blank disc. So they would write some fucking joker-ass little, little punk or little homie on the album, on the CD, but there'd be no music on the thing. So they were literally getting... Are you getting kidding me? They would sell point. their mixtape and there'd be no music on it? Yes. That was a con they had. Oh my god, I've never you heard of that. Home, nothing. Play, you press play, nothing on there. They do all that rap trying to get you to buy it, and then you get hurt oh, yeah. nothing. Yeah, buy my mixtape, buy my mixtape. And they and they try to get in your face, too. So you'd be like, no, I'm not interested. No, I'm not interested. And, uh, yeah, they, they push people. So, like, they, they prey on, like, your, your older people or, like, just, just somebody who's, like, you know, doesn't say no easily. And, and they'd get people to buy them. And they, they, did it, they, they did a special on the news that these people were going home and they didn't even have any music on the CD. They would just buy a spool of like 100 CDs, right? And just write something on them. Like whatever the rap made up rap name was. And then sell them. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do that, you might as well just make a legit bootleg. <clears throat> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, it's all that way, right? Like, I remember, like, the big the big CD that got bootlegged, I remember growing up, was that second Eminem uh, album. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Marshall Mathers LP, right? The, I think it was the second album. that, Or maybe it was the third one. Same thing in my high school. When, when, that when thing got internet. copied and copied. Well, it actually, it, it got released on the internet before it even came out. And, yeah. Because uh, I had a copy of that Eminem album before it even got released in stores. And uh, bitch, I'm, I'm sure you did too. If you're if you're a New Yorker, I'm sure you probably you y'all are down with all that shit, you know. Bitch, I'm gonna kill you. You don't want to fuck with me. <laughs> yeah, M, dude, bro. I, I was a fan of M back when he was with Raucous. I'm I'm sure you're a New Yorker. You know about Raucous Records, right? Not really. No. Oh. I'm a hip hop. I'm a big hip hop head, dude. What's funny is that that's Ryan, are you telling I, me that you're in the recording industry and you don't know about this uh Rockus? Yeah, no, I don't know Rockus. Rock you don't know about Rockus. M was with Rockus before M got with uh with uh you know did did his whole aftermath there. When he when he put out Infinite? Infinite. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think he was he did Infinite. I don't I don't think he did Infinite with Rockus. But he did tracks with Raucous. You know, I don't think M put out an album uh, on Raucous, but he was on like Sound Bombing too. He did tracks with like uh, uh, High, uh, the High and Mighty uh, on the album. They had a uh, Home Field Advantage. Uh, M did a, a track on that. Um, I don't know. And he did some other tracks with some other people, but uh, yeah, the Infinite. 
That was that was I think his first out al- one of his first albums. Yeah, Infinite's the only one I knew about, and then when he signed with Dre for some shady LP. But I listen to a lot of underground rappers though. That's probably one of the more you know. I mean, I, mean, I like of course a lot of the big '90s stuff, the MOP and the Big Puns and the the Locks and you know all that stuff. But uh, a lot of the underground stuff is where it's at, like the Snow Goons and the Diabolics and the Jedi Mind Tricks and all that stuff. The AOTP. A lot of a lot of Philly and Boston, New York rappers as well. You know. Do you like Mob Deep? Fuck yeah. Mob Deep's really good. Yeah, Mob Deep. I, I, I like I like that infamous Mob stuff they put out. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That infam- yeah. Whew. Good God Almighty. The first Wu Tang album, and a lot of their first solo records were good. Yeah, Wu Tang. Um, my yeah, they're, they're, solo I mean, their first they're, solo. They're, I mean, there's just so many. There's so many albums and members of Wu Tang that that's you know. I think I the like, stand, I the standout like, members. I, I like, like, like as far as like standout Wu Tang albums though. Like, uh, man, like, like Supreme Clientele, you know, that Ghostface album, Supreme Clientele. That was uh that was one of my favorites. And then that that uh, couple of RZA albums. RZA is probably my favorite. He's just like lyrically, he's just like a like a robot. Uh, I always like Tribe Called Quest. They're they're kind of more up. Yeah, Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, I, I love the Tribe Called Quest. Tribe Called Quest, R- Roots, Gangstar, a lot of that more mellow stuff. Yeah. yeah, I like that stuff a lot too. Especially the Tribe Called Quest, the last album, one of their last albums, the Love Movement. Uh, man, that, that, yeah. like, every track on that thing's a banger, bro. White white cover on that. I remember that album. Yeah, the white cut. Co- yes, yes, that's it. Love Movement. I wonder how much of it was really Q-Tip, though. Like, I think he was kind of the mastermind. Well, there was Q-Tip. There was... Uh, Five there Dog Who Died. Five Dog Who Died. Five Dog actually put out a really good solo album before he died. Um, yeah, Five Dog. At Five Dog was... was, was, was I, I like him a little bit better as, uh, than MC. I mean, I like the old, old, old Q-Tip. Q-Tip kind of got kind of whack, honestly, and yeah. later on in his career. But uh, Five Dog kept it real, like, all the way up until the day he died, man. When, when, did, when did Tip sell out, like, Vibrant Thing? Fucking right. That one solo album he put out, he sold out with it. Yeah. Yep. Everything after Love Movement is trash. Right. Everything before Love Movement is gold. Did you see the documentary that um I forget that actor did? No. Yeah, there was a good documentary on them, and about like why they broke up and. I yeah, think it's it, weird. Uh, like I, as been... much as I love hip hop and, and 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 all these rappers I like. I, I think the group. And I don't even look at these guys as rappers. I look at them as like a punk rock group. But I, I like the Cottonmouth Kings a lot. Just because they're so bizarre. There's so much history. If you look into some of the history, there's actually a YouTuber called Staunch TV. You should, he's got some pretty cool uh, like documentaries on some like 90s uh, like hip-hop groups and movies and stuff. But uh, he did some, uh, some interviews with some of those guys. And uh, he really did some deep digging on the Cottonmouth Kings. And there's a lot of like crazy stuff that went on there. sure um, um it, yeah there's just like there's like story there's just stuff that you know you could you could like make little tv movies about you know but uh they're not on tv they're on youtube so yeah i'm sure you could find them if you do your research would you would you put jay-z up there with with, with the greatest jay-z uh not really because he's uh, not not for me i mean I like I like Jay Z some of his older stuff, but like I think everything that he did after Blueprint was not great. right. The Black Album was all right. Yeah, Jay Jay Z. I mean, like I said, I tend to more kind of go more towards like the underground scene when it comes to hip hop, but you know when it came to mainstream hip hop like like this like the biggest names to me like you know like like the Tupac's I, I wasn't really a big fan of growing up although I like Tupac now as an adult growing up like Big Pun was big for me Big yeah. Pun was like my I was obsessed with Big Pun um 
Yeah, like everything that he, everything Big Pun did, I was obsessed with. I, I actually met his son, Chris Rivers. I actually got a Big Pun album from Chris Rivers himself um, that never got released. Um, it might have got released now. I, I had an album that got from Chris Rivers that has some unreleased tracks on it. This was maybe 10 years ago or so. What about Biggie, Life After Death? Biggie, uh, Biggie's okay. Biggie's okay, but he's, Biggie's no Big Pun, though. I just liked I liked his lyrics. Iggy, I liked I like his lyrics, but I think like uh, when I look at rappers, I think about what they can do lyrically, and just at the time, Big Pun could he he could decimate all. He was just he was the man lyrically at the time. Now there's people out there that are just as good as Big Pun right now, like Diabolic, uh, Lord Luss. Mm, there's not too many of them. There's a few out there. They're on the level as Big Pong. You ever heard of a guy named Cassie? Cassidy, yeah. No, no, Cassie. No, no, no. I've heard of Cassidy, the rapper Cassidy. No. This guy's like, uh, like kind of like a white guy like Eminem a little bit. What's his name again? D-A-S-K-E-Y. Never heard of him. You know, so many of the rappers like 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 say like Nas, right? It's kinda like the Jay Z effect where everybody else just say Illmatic, right? Like you said, um after that first blueprint, it wasn't the same. A lot of those, a lot of those rappers, they kind of blow their load in the first record. Like their best shit is on there. All that stuff was real derivative at the time for me. That's why I wasn't really into the mainstream hip hop, like the Nas and the Jay Z. It just all kind of sounded the same, at least to me. Um, the, the artists that were really standout artists to to me was the Mob Deep, the Big Pun, uh, you know, the Tribe Called Quest, the Roots, the Gangstar. Those were the the standout artists, like all the, uh, even Onyx, you know, Onyx, they, they, Onyx sold out a little bit, but, uh, did you ever get into, that was it. They did a couple, they did a couple things for, for MTV to get some publicity and that was it. Onyx is a hardcore rap group and the shit that you saw on MTV is not who Onyx is. They're not, they're, they're not like, you know, they're, they're, they're hardcore rap group. You ever listen to Pete Rock, CL Smooth? Yeah, Pete Pete Rock is uh yeah. great, great. <laughs> yeah, dude. Great producer. I think uh I think one of my favorite rap groups, um, I think from like the early late late nineties, early two thousands has gotta be nonfiction. Uh if you're if we're gonna talk about white rappers here. You know, Ill Bill, Sabak Red, and Gore Tex. Or I take it I take it a step further. You're you're a New Yorker, right? The fuck y'all know about Brooklyn Academy? What y'all know about Brooklyn Academy? Nothing. You're, you're, oh my God! All right, so I think most Ryan, of those rappers Ryan are was now, at least around the New York there, area, think... but he's now in Florida. Yeah, I was in Connecticut. All right, so Brooklyn Academy was uh, yeah, Brooklyn Academy was just a like, I don't know, it was just it was a phenomenon for the time. Uh, some of those rappers went on to do amazing things. Some of them died. Um, Pumpkinhead was a big name in Brooklyn Academy. He died maybe 10 years ago. Uh, Mr. Metaphor. What do you think all this mumble rap? It's, it's bullshit. I don't, I hate it. Yeah. It's, I, yeah, I can't stand it. It's, it's, it's childish. It's like, uh, you know, that movie, Idioc- that movie, Idio- Idiocracy. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, yeah. The Mike Judd movie. Idio- Is that what it's called? Idiocracy. They got one tube in his mouth, one in his butt, and then they swap them. Yeah, idiocracy. Well, example, uh, idiocracy. Mumble rap is like is is a manifestation of of what that movie Idiocracy is trying to portray. Yeah, yeah. Mumble rap is like a symptom of what that movie is trying to portray. It's got it's got as ignorant as it can get. Yeah, listen to go on YouTube. Listen to like Snoop Dogg or like you know any any one of the you know, the old school rappers from the nineties. They're like they can't stand it. They hate it. Yeah. They, yeah, they hate it. They they refuse. Snoop Dogg will he will not collaborate with a mumble rapper. You see, he hates it. 
Well, would, even you, would you like consider like Post the, Malone a mumble rapper, though? I would. I yeah, like I Post would Malone. Too. I would consider him a mumble rapper. Really? Yes. Yeah. I just died in. I don't know a lot about that guy, just because I don't know a lot about you know a lot of the, the stuff the kids are listening to now. But uh, if there's anything good out there, it's got to be in the underground because the stuff I'm seeing on on the TV and the radio, unless it's like oldie station, is just not good. Yeah, the, <laughs> the current rap is horrible. Uh. There's some good stuff in the underground, though. Like you know, and, and there's, there's certain like spots of it. Like in in in, in you, you guys are lucky, you know, in, in 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 New York, but you know, Boston and Philly are two hot spots. Baltimore is, is there's some really shitty music, at least rap music that came out of here. There's a couple good artists. One of them's a boss man. He can't. He's from a spot called Eastwood. He uh he makes some pretty good music. And then there was these white boys from South Baltimore that went by the name of uh, 80 Milligrams. That uh, they had some pretty good, some pretty good rap albums or uh, rap tracks, and I, I should say that they put out. But uh, other than that, the, the hip hop scene in Baltimore is just is just awful. <laughs> it's good for some like you know other stuff, but not not the hip hop scene. Well, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, um, to me, it's like music has been disarmed. Okay, so like the the rock music has been they took away the guitars. It's been disarmed. It's not rock anymore. Uh, the rap, it's like they took away the lyrics. In the 90s, they, they rapped about, like, you know, truth, their society, where they were growing up in, the real, real life, like, real life crime. You know, there was a message there, the right? reality rap. And, and, they, and it's like they disarmed rap. They, they made it ignorant. They made it stupid. They made it mumble. They made it. They disarmed. Yeah, yeah, it's like they made it. Yeah, it's like it's like that movie Idiocracy. It's like they. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they dis they disarmed what was what made it relatable. And they took it away, and and when you make it, when you strip it down like that, there's no substance left. Yeah, uh, you know when there's and there's when there's no substance there, you know I I I don't feel the need to to reach out to it or interact with it in any way, you know. Now segueing back to um, video games here, you holding up Giga Wing on the Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. How many good shooters? Talk about some of the good shooters on the Dreamcast. There's quite a few. I'm not that familiar. With the shooters. Uh, okay. Well, actually, there's not a ton, but there are some good ones. Um, the Giga Wings. You had a Giga Wing. You had a sequel that uh, plays well. It's not really good visually, but yeah, Giga Wing 2, it plays well. You have uh, Border Down. I say with the Dreamcast, the interesting thing about the Dreamcast is a lot of the good shooters came out like after the Dreamcast was kind of really a thing, you know? Right. I mean, there are some good ones like Giga Wing, Giga Wing 2, um, you know, Gumbird 2. There was, a few, there was a few good ones that came out, you know, while the Dreamcast was kind of alive and well. But a lot of the stuff that came out shooter-wise came out after the Dreamcast died, um, just because I guess it was easier to program for. Not really sure why. Yeah, because when you think the- about, like, a lot of the launches... On the Dreamcast, you think about like the crazy taxi stuff, Sonic Adventure. You think I a loved lot of- that stuff as a kid. As a kid, I, I had a Dreamcast at launch. I loved that stuff as a kid. Now uh, I just use it for the shooters, you know. Yeah. Dreamcast, you know. I I found this controller for the Dreamcast at the flea market last weekend. It's a sat it's a Saturn controller, but for the Dreamcast. That's cool. Yeah, it's called an Assy Pad. I know it's a weird name, Assy A S C I I. It's a Japanese control. It came out in Japan, but they had it at the flea market, and the dude sold it to me, and it's it's awesome. I'm gonna make a vi- I'm gonna do a video on it soon because the dude I got it from, he knows I have a, U- a YouTube channel. He's like, I want to see you do a video on this controller because it's a it's a rare controller, and they, I, we looked it up online. The thing was selling for like hundreds of dollars. And it had it like the he had the original box and all the paperwork and shit with it. So he said he'd sell it to me if I did a video on it. And I was like, all right. There's some people that are so serious about their their shoot 'em ups, like they'll they'll take a monitor and 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 uh, put it upright. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Flat screen. 
and set it up on its side so it can do a vertical shooter. That's what I do. Straight up. That's what I do. Well, that's what you do. Yeah. And what what do you what do you use to do that? Do you use like a computer monitor and then you can rotate it? No, I just take my TV and flip it on its side. Okay, cool. And and how do you how do you keep it in that in that um, perspective though? Like, do you do you lean it on something? Lean it against the wall. Gotcha. And people do that with pinball machines too. Pinball emulation. Oh, I guess that would make sense if you're emulating it. Yeah, yeah. I guess that would make sense. They're supposed to be having these like these new screen based pinball machines. I guess. Yeah. And, yeah. I, I don't know much about it. But I think that's kind of cool. I think pinball is cool. I like pinball. I like like all the tracks. It's like a roller coaster. It's like a little mini roller coaster. Yeah. All the little tracks, and there was actually a pinball machine that I remember as a kid, where it was like a roller coaster, and there's like people throwing up on it. That's funny. You know what I'm talking about? Like the the graphic was like people on a roller coaster like throwing up in the background. It was like a pinball machine. Not specifically, but I can picture it. Yeah, it's. I, I wish I knew. I don't know if there's people in the chat that know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, it's like a pinball machine and it's like it's like a graphic of like people barfing and i don't know for some reason there's like a picture of that's like popping up in my head and they, they put out they put a couple collections out see that um, game there sonic blast man 2 i yeah. think that's like a, a valuable game i think i mean obviously that was in terrible condition but I remember when I found that, I looked it up and at the time i don't know what it is now but i remember when i found that that being pretty rare I'll look it up right now. Sonic Blast Man 2. Uh, Lu- wow. You're right. Loose, it's 225. Complete, it's 425. Yeah. I think that one obviously got pretty cheap. It's beat up. but See, something like that, that's an example of a game I would keep it in that condition. I wouldn't... Uh, but I do this with all games, like I was saying. But you, you know, know the the original story why they call it Sonic Blast Man because you blow your whole load on what it costs. Oh, <laughs> not if you get it at the flea market. How much do you pay for it at the flea market? That maybe forty bucks. Nice, something like that, and in that condition. And you know they say and if I was to sell something like that, I probably wouldn't sell that for more than sixty. You know the reason they say it, it yellows like that? And it's not because of sunlight. Heat. They say that heat. Like when you have like um, like the old PC monitors. If, if you store them, like if you see somebody store some shit in a garage or an attic and it's a lot of heat, that turns them yellow. It's fr- from what I've heard, not the sun. It's not sun fading. It's heat. It does that. Is that what it does is the heat. I didn't know what turns them yellow because it's weird. Yeah. You look at a cartridge and like one side of it will be yellow and the other side isn't. And I'm if like, I wonder, did someone swip the cart? Did, did someone swap it or did, I don't know. It's some kind of chemical reaction with like heat and humidity over time. It yellows it. That game right there on the screen. See that cotton, that, that white PS1 game. That's a rare yeah. game. That thing was rare. When I found that, I flipped out. That's 100% cotton on the PS1. I've only seen that one time in my whole life, and I own it. Now i got to look that one up. How do you spell it? If, if you can find one for sale, you might not see any examples of any, any for sale. It's, a, it's that rare. So just a hundred percent cotton. Not not. There's there's a couple different cottons that came out on the PS1, but this one specifically is a, it's a it's a port of the Super Famicom, a hundred percent cotton on the PS1. I say in two fifty. Two fifty. Two fifty. There are some then for sale. But I remember when I found that I could not find any for sale. So we, had to make, we had to make up like. a price for it because we couldn't find any example or any that sold or anything. That's how it is too, like with toy collecting. Like you'll you'll get a lesser known line like of action figures. Sometimes there's only like one for sale on eBay. That's it, you know. And you can't with- go off that because you can't base an entire market off of of the sale or non sale of one item. 
So it's right. like, you know, so at that point, it's like, well, this is what I'm comfortable paying for this. And it's either you're going to accept it or not, you know? Outrun is such a classic racing game, such great music. That's the, the Outrun 2006 Coast to Coast is, is awesome. And I, I'm not even a huge racing game fan. I fucking love that game. And it's like you're slipping and sliding on the turns in that. That's know? what makes it so much fun, you know, because it's like, it's like the Mario Kart thing, how you're sliding around, but they perfected it. And you know, Sega perfected that mechanic and then the Outrun, or whoever programmed that game. It probably wasn't Sega. It was whoever had Sega, you know, Sega had working for them. I miss the, um, I miss games like the Burnout series, you know? I never played a burnout game. I've heard about them, but well, what they what what they stood out for was the the battle crashing. Like you you you're, you're you the feeling of extreme high speed, but you're slamming into cars at the same time, and they're flying all over the place. Uh, if you've ever played Mo- Motorstorm too, those games, Motorstorm games, same kind of idea. Like you're kind of bat- battle racing. Um, but but what yeah, what made them so fun was they usually had great soundtracks. They had an extreme sense of speed with the nitrous, and you're really battle battling the other cars as like a main game feature. Like you're slamming into cars, like Twisted Metal, like. Well, in Twisted Metal is more like more like kind of overhead combat, kind of like uh, almost like tank kind of combat, right? But like. Right. This, like you're slamming through cars like uh they're flying like in like in an action movie. Oh, okay. So it's more of like an action okay, I got you. So you're you're slamming into them and you're not gonna crash, right? So like you're they almost have like no weight to them. Like you're slamming cars and they're kind of flying around. Cause like, you know, in any other game you slam a car, you're gonna crash, right? This is like you you catch speed as you smash into cars. You build up, you build up nitrous as you smash into more cars. So it's like battle racing. I remember growing up on the PS One. I remember playing, and this is not a game I would ever play as an adult. But I remember playing Gran Turismo and like building. And I remember the fun of that being building up the stats. Yes, I remember having this like Supra, and that was like the best car in the game. I, I guess at the time, I don't quite remember but i do remember having the super that was like it was like all the stats were maxed out on it and it took like forever to get to that point yeah as a matter of fact i'm lying i think i had like a hacked memory card or stole someone's memory card or something or copied someone's memory card and got that super that's how i got it so i didn't grind and get it like i should have i think i stole it from someone else so john in, in kind of wrapping up here, you said it all. Tell us some advice you have. Say somebody is thinking about making a YouTube channel, you know. Say they're, you know, maybe lacking the confidence to do it, lacking the motivation, lacking the direction. What would you tell to somebody starting out a YouTube channel? What would be some advice you'd give to them? I would say if you're going to start a YouTube channel, whatever – you whatever even if it's not about gaming you know whatever hobby you have i think that a youtube channel is good whatever hobby you have talk about your hobby because if it's your hobby you're obviously passionate about it right it's your hobby how could you not be it wouldn't be your hobby if you're not passionate about it so whatever hobby you have that's what you want to talk about and if you throw your your feelers out there you're going to find your people because uh there's just people out there for everyone right Everyone's, everyone has their community. Absolutely. Well Even said. Even if you're part of someone else's community, you're still part of a community, right? I'm part Very of many different people's communities, you know? Very true. Yeah, people have, like, a big hobby of mine's hip-hop. A big hobby of mine is video games. Um, you know, I have, uh, you know, a couple, other, a couple other hobbies. Video games is probably, other than my family, you know, my woman and my kid, um video games are, 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 are my my second biggest love in life other than family and friends absolutely well listen john thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview tonight thank you for being on the show 
I'm going to be in touch with you, uh, following your content, but also to get, you know, I, some of the, some of your friends that you'd like to, you know, nominate to be on the show. I'd like to reach out to them. Yeah, um, there's some people that come to mind that I think would be a great fit for your uh, your kind. I think that uh, yeah, I think that you you do well as like an interviewer. You ask good questions. You're good at uh, thank you. You're keeping things on the rails, so to speak. Um, yeah, I can think of some people that would. I think Dan from Rebel Gaming Club would do really well with you. Um, so I'm going to reach out to him and see what I can do there. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and, yeah. uh, yeah, just DM me back on uh super mega retro news, Twitter, and I'll be in touch with you. We'll, we'll figure out who, who you, who you think would be a good fit. And then I'll kind of give him the info too, after you touch base. And yeah, man, I appreciate you taking the time. I know this is kind of your night off. That means a lot that you, you spent it with us. Uh, we're, we, you know, we've been dropping your links here and there. Throughout the stream, uh, this will be, you know, uploaded in its own interview specifically. It's not just going to stay in the stream. It's going to be cut, you know, from the start to the finish in its own interview separately uploaded. So as soon as that's up, I'm going to get you the link. And uh, we're going to continue to keep up with your content. Hopefully, don't be a stranger to us. Stop by any time. Yeah, I look forward to you know. I, I see that you 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 got you got some interviews posted with my job. I am able with some Bluetooth headphones, of course. I'm able to listen to a lot of you know YouTube videos at work. Um, so yeah, I can definitely keep up with your guys' content too, dude. Absolutely, and we're looking forward to what you're going to put out in the future. Great content, great channel. And right, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your night.